NASA has revealed its first asteroid samples delivered last month by a spacecraft. Joining us live is Fred Watson, Australia's astronomer at large. Fred, good to see you. NASA seemed pretty proud to be able to show off this asteroid sample, Fred. And, and they also revealed that it contains water and carbon. Was that a surprise? Uh, yes and no. Um, it, it's suspected that um, much of the Earth's water actually arrived via asteroids in the early history of the solar system. Uh, and this doesn't exactly confirm that, but it does suggest that these what are called carbonaceous asteroids, like Bennu, from which this sample came, uh, they are uh, rich in water and perhaps rich enough that if many of them hit the Earth in the Earth's early history, yes, we got the water from there. But the carbon is also of interest because we know that um, some of the organic molecules, the carbon-containing molecules, that are the precursors of life, they originated in space. And this only serves to confirm that. Some really interesting stuff, though, coming from the Johnson Space Centre. And so why did NASA choose that particular asteroid, the, the Bennu asteroid, to take a sample from in the first place? Uh, a few practical reasons, like it's what's called a near-Earth asteroid. It comes near the Earth, and so that means that you don't have to go far to, to rendezvous with it. Uh, and also because it is a carbonaceous asteroid. It's an, an asteroid that's got, uh, we know from uh, what you might call remote sensing, uh, that it's got a high carbon content. And so uh, the uh, OSIRIS-REx spacecraft, a very fancy name for a very fancy device, uh, had on board what is called a TAGSAM. And the TAGSAM is the touch and go sample acquisition mechanism, uh, which pulled samples of the asteroid's soil uh, because it's kind of a, a rubble pile asteroid, so very loosely bound, pulled samples of the asteroid soil, put them in a box and sent them back to Earth. And that's where we've got to now. Right. OK. Well, Fred, I understand you've just returned from a, a conference looking into space junk and, and how to deal with so many satellites that are now up in space. So tell us, what impact do all of those satellites actually have on astronomy? What are the big concerns here? Yeah, really a serious issue that's emerged in the last uh, four years. The first tranche of Starlink satellites were launched by SpaceX in May 2019. And uh, the Earth's uh, astronomers greeted that with with surprise and uh, not a little grumbling as well, because uh, potentially these satellites are going to be 12,000 in number. We've got 5,126 in orbit at the moment, uh, and they do interfere with astronomical observations. There is no question of that, both uh, using optical telescopes, visible light telescopes, and radio telescopes, because the radio signals uh, uh, that are coming from the spacecraft themselves actually interfere with radio astronomy observations. So since 2019, there's been a lot of activity uh, in the astronomical world, and it culminated in the conference uh, that I was at last week in uh, Santa Cruz de la Palma in the Canary Islands, where the astronomers got together, not just with other astronomers, but also with satellite operators, uh, because the, one of the really good things that's coming out of this uh, is a, a, a sort of peaceful coexistence, if I can put it that way, between the satellite operators who realize that there is an issue for astronomers, and the astronomers themselves who are doing a lot of work to try and mitigate the effects of those satellites. It's a problem that's only going to get worse, but this dialogue between the industry and the astronomers, I think, is the way forward. Fred, we're just showing our, our viewers um, some images there, these graphics showing what it looks like when a, a satellite breaks up. Does that happen very often, that they run into each other? And, and how does that all work in terms of trying to ensure that, that they are safe and stable up there? Yes, that's right. So the, the, there is, um, you know, there are protocols regarding the orbits that satellites are in. Uh, but the industry itself is concerned about exactly this. There is uh, a lot of work being done on what's called uh, sustainability, space to su sustainability. How many uh, satellites can you put up there without them running into one another and causing even more space debris? Uh, that's another field very actively uh, be being pursued by the space industry. Uh, space satellites do naturally decay their orbits, which means that they gradually come down to Earth in a, a long, slow spiral, which eventually results in them hitting the Earth's atmosphere and burning up. And that will be what will happen to the Starlink satellites that we're talking about when they reach the ends of their lives. So nowadays, you've got to have a kind of end plan for any satellite that you put up into orbit. And that, again, can only be a good thing. Fred Watson, always fascinating speaking with you. Thanks for your time. Great pleasure. Thanks, Ash.